Good afternoon, everyone. This is uh, another roundtable from uh, which is in collaboration with International Relations Cluster and the Environment Cluster of the Center for New, New, New Economic Studies, Jindal. And today, the focus of this cluster would be on the recent havoc which was inflicted on Pakistan by the floods of 2022. Uh, the title is Global Impact of the Climate Crisis with a special focus, focus on the floods on Pakistan. And since the whole geography is interconnected, uh, like the uh, Chinese droughts, Pakistani floods, and now what's happening in India, how it has shifted towards India, this is all connected. So uh, we will start from there. So as an introduction to the whole debate on the climate catastrophe and to just contextualize the uh, discussion, what has been happening in Pakistan and what has been uh, the severe what have been the really severe impacts of the recent floods? Malika, how, yeah. why don't you go first? Yeah, so the recent floods in Pakistan are, as we all know, they have been devastating with one third of the country being flooded and 33 million people being affected. Seven million have been displaced temporarily, we hope. But in the summer of this year, Pakistan experienced consistent, uh, well, a consistent temperature above 45 degrees Celsius. And this extreme heat caused a lot of moisture levels in the atmosphere to rise and also caused a lot of melting, like accelerated the already melting uh, or the already accelerated the pace of the melting of the glaciers. Pakistan is like one of the countries that have, is the only country that outside of the poles has the most number of glaciers with around like 7,200 glaciers. And this caused the, the extreme moisture and the melting of the glaciers caused this sort of phenomenon where not only there was heavy rainfall, there was also like the bursting of banks of rivers, especially the Indus. And there was also flash floods that took place because of all of these different phenomena taking place. And so some scientists are claiming this to be a result of the El Nina effect because the El Nina has been acting very erratically and has been causing a lot of disturbances in many, in many regions of the Enso. So this has enhanced monsoon rains in not just Pakistan, but in every region that the ENSO uh, affects. And due to the uncertainties in the research, like a lot of like like because like weather weather is like something that is a very erratic thing to even like have a sort of like measure. And rainfall especially is something even more erratic. So researchers haven't exactly been able to pinpoint the cause of it and haven't been able to link it directly to climate change. But it's obvious, they have obviously been able to say that the extreme heat has been a result of uh, human interaction with the climate and human interference in general climate of the world. That's a good overview. Uh, anyone else would like to contribute to that? Sanjana? Uh, apart from that, there's also been a lot of monetary damage with over $10 billion of damage overall, a million homes being destroyed. A lot of infrastructure was also destroyed due to the floods with like over 100 bridges, 3,000 kilometers of roads. And uh, similarly, there was a lot of damage to the livestock with uh, 800,000 farm animals being uh, perished and over 200, 2 million acres of crops being affected to the flood, which makes the situation even worse for the people there. And right now there's a whole scale uh, uh, disease outbreak happening in parts of uh, lower basins of uh, Indus River. So that's another thing. So yeah, it has been pretty devastating. Now, uh, do you think that the floods uh, which have occurred, uh, they are only an exception this is because last time they happened on, although this is the like on the bigger scale, but last time it was 2010. So can we just say that the, these floods were an exception in Pakistan and were not collected to the whole thing? Or if so, have the world leaders acknowledged it? And are they taking any measures I mean, beyond uh, like donor, uh, donor immediate relief? Are they taking any measures regarding this? So world leaders have responded. Everybody is responding to this, uh, to what has happened in Pakistan. And... Uh, Something that people are talking about. So the Asian countries and COP, I think uh, the COP 23, I mean, they have done, they have taken a stance on having, they put a climate change clause and they all signed it and trying to work actively against climate change because Indonesia and Malaysia were experiencing severe floods as we saw last year. So something that people have been saying is that the South Asian region can also get a clause together and start fighting climate change within this region by itself. 
And so India has sort of responded to that and said that they agree with it. But with other Sri Lanka also going through like a crisis right now and everything happening in different South Asian countries, it's uh, something that might take a little time because of the political situation here. But other countries have responded with the US, China, UAE and all have like, uh, have all responded and provided help and assistance and sent over uh, soldiers and food items to help the country with what is happening. And especially the UN has spoken up about it to talk about what, why they think the UN is saying that climate change is the most, the major reason for why they have linked it directly to climate change, something that scientists are not willing to do, but because of the lack of research and information. But the UN is, has directly said that this is this is something that has been caused by climate change. And even though they have given like funds and everything, they are trying to push for major climate policies being implemented in at least the South Asian region. And so yeah, that's the most that people have like said against it because there's no because we have always seen that action is not going to is not taking place. While words have been said, the intention is different than action. And unless there is even if there is intention for people to do something, the action is what we require right now. Because in such a devastating thing, in a, phenom in a phenomenon like this, where so many people have been affected, like 7 million people displaced, 33 million people like affected, it's insane. So yeah, so unless we see action taking place, that is something that has not yet happened. But we see the intention for people to start um, at least a movement. And hopefully this might encourage them to take their final step. I mean, that's true. And the next kind of question is, is in continuation with let's expand this point a bit further. So uh, I mean, the argument which came up from uh, within the South Asian region or the lesser developed regions which, that they are taking the brunt for the cumulative emissions and actions of the West developed world till now, where the per capita consumption of emissions are still relatively higher than even China or India. Uh, is there any merit to this argument? And how many more instances of similar nature where like the higher countries consume a lot, they emit a lot, and then the lower crowd countries take a brunt? How many other examples can we see of this? Raymond? Uh, during the Glasgow uh, climate negotiations that happened, the Prime Minister of Barbados raised the same issue that, that is being discussed by the question. So at the time, there was uh, the, a, a variety of cases were cited of Barbados, the Dominican Republic, island nations such as Tuvalu and Fiji, uh, which are increasingly going into a state of drowning, a physical drowning state, because 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 not 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 only because they are they have like a, a small share of uh, uh, greenhouse gas emissions, but that other countries are imposing their greenhouse gas emissions, their climate uh, commitments. The mostly the developed world on these on these smaller countries. So, uh, for example, the hurricanes of Erika and uh, the va the various floods that have been coming on Fiji and the state in which uh, Tuvalu is. I, I I don't think I need any uh, introduction on that because Tuvalu is just uh, about a decade away from getting completely submerged. So. Uh, uh, so these are these are some of the cases that were cited to establish a. a sort of a, a, a disaster relief or, or, or a loss and damage fund that was needed from the developed world. So this argument is increasingly gaining traction as, as soon as, 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 as we see more and more floods. Secondly, there is also the concept of sand wars. So uh, the developed, the bigger, de the increasingly growing countries or the developed countries have, incre have been sending these, uh, have been operating through these mafias in uh, uh, island countries such as the Maldives, Mauritius, etc., which steal sand. So what happens when they steal sand is that the sea levels are rising. The sea levels are continually rising. And that causes salt water to enter into the river delta, which is causing a damage of farming crops, which is causing a damage to crops. There's no fresh water available. And soon, uh, the implication for the island countries is that they're uh, starting to receive water on their roads the water levels are rising and into their houses. So there is a massive relocation that has that that is also taking place. And the brunt of the sand is going towards building cities like Dubai, building, uh, building these uh, uh, islands, 
sort of the islands that uh, China has been building in the South China Sea. All of them are products of sand. So I think that uh, thing is also emphasized in the argument that developed countries need to developed countries need to account for what they're what they've been doing with uh, the climate crisis and imposing that crisis on uh, the developing world. Uh, would anyone else like to add, add, add to that? Sanjana? Yeah, apart from that, we can also see the sheer amount of time it takes developing countries to rebuild after a natural disaster. And since most of them are in the coastal regions, as uh, Raymond mentioned, they're more geographically vulnerable to these storms and floods also. Uh, for example, the island states in the Caribbean have all, are already very vulnerable to the storms. And in 2020 alone, they had 30 record-breaking tropical storms uh, that were caused uh, due to the climate crisis. But if you see, uh, these countries are the ones that have contributed the least to the global emissions. So uh, Cuba has contributed 0.1%, Haiti and Barbados have contributed 0.0% compared to the US's 25% of historical emissions and 22 by the European Union. So you can see that there's a very clear uh, correlation with the developing co developed countries contributing a lot to CO2 and the brunt being uh, held by the underdeveloped and developing countries. Now, uh, this is not, uh, it's not hidden from anyone what's happening to the developing countries, especially the island nations, as was pointed out. Maldives is uh, the nearest example we have in that case. But what do you, is ha since the last collective action on climate change was the climate uh, agreement and the Paris Climate Accord, and then what we saw what happened to it, the biggest signatory to it, uh, the most powerful signatory just withdrew and then it rejoined and there has been a total inconsistency in that policy and several other politicians have also, uh, world leaders have also expressed their desire to not cooperate with all the clauses, all the actions uh, mentioned there. So do you see any collective sense of urgency which takes into account the concerns of the global south or is the concern just half as a, they are just looking out for themselves and we are all doing it? Is it that grim? Um, uh, I guess uh, the the question here is uh, uh, like the haphazard efforts that have been carried out towards uh, uh, towards you know rectifying the climate crisis have been surely based on liability. Nobody wants to accept that they have uh, been this this uh, responsible for this percent of the climate crisis or anything because. Then it's 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 the same with the loss and damage fund that was proposed uh, in the Glasgow summit, that everyone wants to avoid this liability, liability as in this would attract international uh, court cases. Many of these court cases have been launched against governments, against uh, companies such as uh, Total and Shell, oil producing companies, which have been held responsible for climate change. So I think until that liability uh, mindset uh, exists there won't be any coherent action that could be taken. For action, there needs to be responsibility, as many of the activists have said. Now that responsibility is itself absent. So the action part is still, uh, I think, a bit, it's going to be a bit haphazard and far, farther away. Malika, you want to say something? Yeah. It's like people are just, unless the, unless the developed nation starting responsibility, forget court cases, just start providing aid, start providing the technology, that kind of infrastructure that developing countries who are getting affected by climate change, by man-made climate change, climate change that developed countries have had a major hand in increasing and getting to where we are right now. They need to start taking initiatives to start providing aid, not just monetary aid. It's just it's aid in like providing the technology that developed countries require to sort of battle what is coming right now. If me like if we could have predicted the if you know if we had paid greater attention, like we already knew what the what heat waves meant, like what is the consequences that heat waves could have. We already knew that it would cause floods. We saw the same thing happen in North India also this year. We had how many? We had three heat waves over here with temperatures even like 47 degrees to 48 degrees. Like like the extreme heat and 
we expect and we anticipated that the floods are going to happen. So initiative was taken by the government to like you know to uh, empower the banks of the rivers and stuff. If that same initiative was taken when uh, Pakistan experienced those uh, experience that heat, because uh, like you know to like put that technology and put that infrastructure into stop what is going to happen, what's not what's like not what's not likely going to happen, what is definitely going to happen because we all know that. The scientists knew that extreme heat will cause moisture in the air. The scientists know that there is there are glaciers in Pakistan. It's going to cause them to it's going to accelerate the melting process of it. So if this this knowledge is there, but if there's no action taken towards, then there's no point. So that's what we need to have. We need to see, like like Raymond said, it's very right what he's saying. Unless there is action, nothing can be done. And you know the action needs to be done by the developed countries because they are the ones who are standing at like the top. They are the ones who have who have things sorted out. If climate change, if it was, if it did affect them, it would not be at the scale that we're seeing happening in Pakistan. It's absolutely ridiculous. The amount of people who have been hurt, who have been displaced is crazy. Um, so the action is lacking for now. Um, and I think in some time, even the donor fatigue will set in in the case of Pakistan and then they will have to deal with the rest on their own. Now, uh, as we already know, uh, transnational interests, geopolitics, it's not going anywhere. Regardless of how many catastrophes are get inflicted one after another, it's going to stay the same great power rivalry, even like neighborhoods which are fractured, like South Asia, they're not going to cooperate on this. Uh, it's a miracle that Indus Water, Indus Water Treaty between India and Pakistan is holding at it as it is. Otherwise, there would have been some kind of contention on that even. So when it comes to like collective action, let's start on a regional level. I mean, do these transnational efforts which are required, aid, rehabilitation, relief, it would have been easier if like neighboring countries would have been in the position to help Pakistan at this point immediately. Do you think like competing interests for how long and why do they actually block the countries from cooperating on this end? What is the main? problem there. Sanjana? Let me just state that question again. When it comes to environmental crisis and transnational aid, do you believe in, do you believe that competing interests between neighboring states can be overruled? I'm not sure if they can be overruled, but I do believe it needs to be overruled and looked at from a very global perspective because the crisis obviously affects everyone. And unless we come together, especially neighboring countries, because they're the ones who can be there to provide aid at the earliest, need to come together, regardless of their uh, other competing interests. I mean, we agree that they should be, but can they be? Yeah, Raymond. Um, I think competing interests have at least remotely as well defined uh, defined certain climate actions as well. So, for example, in 2008, when uh, Sri Lanka experienced the tsunamis, four countries got together. Uh, it, four countries who were traditional powers in the Indian Ocean region got together and helped Sri Lanka rehabilitated it. These were India, Australia, Japan, and the United States, which later went on to form the Quad. So I think competing interests also cause, uh, cause a coherent climate action to deny any other power for, uh, uh, from entering the, uh, you know, the good space of a, of a country, of a country which is under a climate crisis. So I think uh, that that has a real, really good pin on... Uh, how climate crises are handled. So I think competing interests will is is here to stay. Because in 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 the current regional order, uh, strategic realism will always prevail above, uh, I think, human rights as as it is being shown. So uh, I think that argument will be here to stay. That's a pretty cynical and therefore pretty realistic take on what will actually happen. Um, yeah, it's true. Quad emerged out of a natural natural disaster. 
and the china rivalry happened the rivalry thing happened a bit later so maybe efforts like that can be scaled up maybe um, global power politics can be used to, for the benefit of the less developed countries so i think yeah we should hope for that that's the best we can hope cynically cynical as it might be and that's my that might be our only way out so thank you everyone sanjana raymond and malika that's it for today thank you for attending this session and we will see you next time